Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. David, welcome to the podcast. It's so good to have you. Thanks for the invitation, Carrie. Delighted to be here. Yeah. So you've been teaching Getting Things Done Now for decades, and you've given thousands of interviews. You've been interviewed literally all over the world by almost every conceivable media outlet. And here you are, saying yes to a guy like me and say, yeah, I'm going to talk about this. What what aspect of getting things done are you not tired of talking about yet? Actually, nothing. You know, it, it, it's funny. You, anybody pokes at me about this stuff, I couldn't help but share it because, you know, I'll, I'll retrace the steps way back to sort of the founding years when I was putting this together and, and, and sort of cobbling the methodology together. I really realized that it's it's the basis of a lot of I think what we're about here on the planet, which is completion and creation. You know, finishing what you start, and then being aware of what you start, right? Mm-hmm. And in a sense, anybody who wants to improve their their life and get more of a sense of you know and, and create an improved condition in terms of whatever it is that they're doing. Um, I couldn't not share this. So I, I couldn't stop if I wanted to. Is it just the best things that, you know, it's, it's not running with scissors. There's nothing dangerous about what I do or what I talk about. Anything, any, if anybody implements even the tiniest little piece of what I came up with as best practices, it will improve their condition, make them feel more in control, more focused, you know, more, have more space to focus on cool stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, that's, that, that's a, it's a given it's not necessarily a given for everybody. I mean, it, it's a given, meaning there are no holes in this. Anybody who implements this produces those results. So, you know, I have a, a kind of a ministerial thought uh, or just uh, inclination about this. I'm not preaching, but I'm, I'm you know, I, I love to help people and be of assistance if I can. So anybody, but if people ask, I'm not out on the street corner, you know, you know wanting to <laughs> sign people up. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. You had kind of a circuitous path into this. I mean, you found yourself at Berkeley in 1968, which is, you know, the last thing you would expect somebody at Berkeley in 1968. Correct me if I'm wrong to be advising executives around the world on productivity and effectiveness down the road. I mean, that's kind of a yeah. that's kind of a bizarre path. Could have fooled me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of our leaders, as you and I talked about before we started recording, uh, who are listening to this, they're younger. And so they were uh, the original. I've got the updated, uh, really appreciated the updated edition of Getting Things Done, which you released, I think, recently, fairly recently, a few years ago. Uh, but the original one came out, what, in 2001 or thereabouts? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of listeners were like, hey, I was in grade school or a couple were in diapers or, you know, they were in high school and they weren't exactly picking up business books. Um, can you give us an overview of the framework just for people who perhaps only have pieces of it or they don't know about it yet? Sure. It's really a set of best practices that I uncovered, uh, unfolded. Uh, it, 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 in a sense, I didn't, I didn't, make it up, I recognize what it is that we actually do when things really work. We all have better days than others. And so what is it that makes a better day? The day doesn't care. I mean, look outside, the the, the world is fine. It's not out of control. It's not, doesn't have any anxiety. It's just fine. It's only how we engage with our world that creates that, that pressure, that, that, that anxiety, that angst, that sense of overwhelm, uh, or that sense of lack of clarity, if you will. So, you know, I just discovered because I had a, I was very interested in how do I keep my brain free? I'm a real freedom kind of guy. Don't fence me in. Don't, you know, I hate being distracted by stuff I can't do anything about. You know, and I, I, you know, kind of learned all that stuff just in my in my self growth days. You know, back in the, you know, back in the California in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, and you know, 80s when I was very much involved in all that. 
Anyway, so it, it's a set of best practices that I uncovered that are not hard to do. As a matter of fact, most people are doing these practices to some degree. Hmm. And it's like, how do I get the day under control? How do I get my situation under control and clear, whether it's your kitchen or your, your desk or a company or your consciousness? And I just, I just recognize the five steps we go through to do that, where you capture that as you identify the stuff that's not on cruise control, that's got your attention. You then clarify the things that, that have your attention, what you're going to do about them, if anything, any actions that you need to be take about them or any outcomes that you need to keep track of until they're finished. And then you need to organize those reminders in some sort of trusted external brain. You know, like your calendar or something external that you write down, oh, here are the errands I need to run. Here's the stuff I need to talk to my partner about. Here's whatever. Mm -hmm. You're keeping track of the stuff you can't finish in the moment you think of it, but you still need to keep track of it and be reminded about it. So that's the step three. And once you've captured and then clarified and organized step three into some trusted external brain, step four is to make sure you use that external brain and look at it. You know, you look at your calendar to know where you need to be when this afternoon, or you look at, you know, you look at your errands list to see, by the way, when I go out and about, or when I surf for the web, here's the things I need to go look for, you know, and taking that step four, which is the reflect process and reflect can take on a lot of different forms all the way up to, you know, any kind of reflection on strategy, purpose, vision, goals, you know, any and all those kind of bigger, bigger horizon stuff. And then you engage. Engage meaning you put your attention and your activity based upon a look at all of that in some trusted form. So those five steps of capture, clarify, organize, reflect, and engage is how you get anything under control that may that may not be on cruise control yet. That's what you do. And it, but each one of those steps, uh, Carrie, has its own uh, its own tools and techniques, and they're right. different, right? Just taking notes in a meeting is very different than deciding what you're going to do about those notes after the meeting, which is very different than keeping track of things that other people said they were going to do or that you're going to do out of those notes. So those that's just capture, clarify, and organize. But those are different things. So, And most people do some version of all of that or they wouldn't be listening to us right now. Hmm. Uh, but very few people do do it completely. And so they walk around still using their head as their office, and their head's a crappy office. Your brain, your brain did not evolve to remember, mind, prioritize, or manage relationships between more than four things. Otherwise, you'll start to sub-optimize your ability to take a test, your ability to write a business plan, your ability to be present with your kids when you tuck them in the bed. So, and that's just, I discovered that on the street experientially 35 years ago with this stuff. The cognitive scientists have in the last 10 years validated that lots of experiments and lots of other things. So that's a lot of that's that's a lot of the kind of the basics of getting things done is those five steps and getting the best practices of those five steps under control and, and actually doing that, implementing it. And then there's kind of the vertical, how do I set priorities or how do I get clear about what I need to focus on? And I came up with the sort of identified the six horizons that we actually have commitments about starting at the top call, why are you here? What's your purpose and what are your core values? You know, coming down to, okay, well, what's the vision of, of implementing that successfully? Coming down to then what are the things you need to accomplish over the you know, next year or two to make your vision happen? Coming down to what are the things you need to maintain so you have balance and, and equilibrium in your life to be able to get there? And then, you know, come down another level to all the projects you have about any of the moving parts there. And then you have all the action steps you need to take about any of those moving parts. So I couldn't get it any simpler than that. Uh, when people yeah, say set priorities, I say, you know, okay, which, which horizon are you still unclear about? Hmm. No, it's so, it's such a good system and I have used parts of it. I actually getting ready for this interview. And, and when you said, yes, I, I picked up the new copy and I'm like, you know what? I gotta, I gotta integrate this more. I work with a lot of young leaders, interns, um, people I hire straight out of college. And I'm amazed at how many times, even today, young leaders will say, I gotta start writing things down. Like they have kept their whole life, their exam schedule, their school schedule, their homework schedule, kind of in their head. And this whole idea of writing something down almost feels like a defeat. I remember when I hit that stage as a young leader, it's like, oh, really? My brain isn't that big enough that that I can keep everything uh, in my head. And you make the argument that you really can't, right? What is it that uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get this right? But I think one of the quotes in your book is, your brain is good at having ideas, not holding ideas. 
that you, yeah. you really got to write it down. Can you talk about the power of writing it down? And maybe I know you meet with executives, like high functioning executives who have not written everything down. And they, they get a bit of a sobering wake up call when they see how much stuff they have been trying to carry in their heads. Can you, can you talk to leaders about that? Yeah. Keep it in your head. It's in the wrong place. <laughs> You'll give it more attention than it deserves or not as much attention as it deserves if it's just in your head. Because keeping things in your head, where you keep that, if that's the only place you're keeping track of, the uh, hire the vice president, should we get divorced, should we adopt, you know, should we really renovate the kitchen, you know, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff, the stuff banging around in there. Each one of those ideas takes up sort of the same amount of cognitive real estate, and any one of them will wake you up at three o'clock in the morning when you can't do anything about it. So, so your brain doesn't have one. If it, if it did, it would only remind you of stuff when you could actually do something about it. So, you know, everybody listening to this has some, something that probably needs a battery. And where are you reminded you need a battery when you try to turn on the damn flashlight? Right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, duh, that, that's the wrong, that's the wrong place to be reminded that you need the battery, right? If it's me, I put the battery or the flashlight in my entry so that some part of me goes, wait a minute, David, I guess I could need to get batteries, right? So then I go on the web and order them or put them on my errands list to make sure I pick them up when I'm in a store that has them. So it's, you know, in a sense, it's that simple. It's externalizing the stuff so that things, so that the small stuff doesn't take any more attention than it deserves. So if you don't give appropriate attention to anything that has your attention, it'll, it'll, it'll take more of your attention than it deserves. Yeah. You know, you so, mentioned batteries. So we have some ceiling fans uh, up on the bedroom floor in our house and uh, they need a new batteries. And I didn't write it down. It's like, oh, I'll get them next time I'm out. And I think it was about a month. And every once in a while, I would just get this random, like, I'd be riding my bike and it would be like, oh, you got to get batteries. But I'm riding my bike. I can't write it down, right? And then you're cooking dinner and it's like, oh, I got to get batteries for those fans. Or you go to turn it off at night and it's like, oh, I got to get batteries. Went to a hardware store, did not get batteries because it didn't occur to me at the moment. That is like basically who we are as human beings, right? That's what you're saying at the macro level. Like we got to get that renovation done or I need to write a book right down to, I got to get batteries for that stupid ceiling fan level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that the batteries needing batteries took up a lot more of your cognitive real estate than it deserved. Yep. And let's go to this dumb guy called Albert Einstein. who said, <laughs> Why should I keep track of my own phone number? I can look it up. There are better things to be thinking about. Right? No kidding. Yeah. So it's not about and not about getting yourself stupid by getting stuff out of your brain. It's like getting access to intuitive intelligence by getting your head clear of all that stuff. So when you meet with leaders and you sit down with them for the first time, if you're doing a consultation what do you encourage them to do if they've got like a to-do list, but it's partial, it has like, okay, you know, empty my inbox and uh, work on this project and put the financials together, but it doesn't have like batteries or dinner or your mom's birthday gift or that book you're going to write. Like, what do you, what do you, what is the first step to capturing? Well, the first step is making sure that they, they want to do this process. And sometimes it's better off to tell them to not tell them anything about what the process is. Just assume they trust, you know, let me lead them down the path. <laughs> right. right? right. Cause, Cause if they really knew what we were going to do, they'd probably run out of the door. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work, isn't it? <laughs> we're going to get everything out of your head. So if assuming that they bought into the, the coaching process that, that I spent thousands of hours one-on-one -on -one with, with, with some of the best and brightest actually doing the first step is the first step. Let's uh, identify everything that has your attention, anything that's not on cruise control. And usually the, the most obvious place to start is their desk. Like what's on their desk, in their desk, under the desk, around their desk that doesn't belong there permanently. Because if it doesn't, it's talking to them. Mm. telling them It's uh, going, do something with me, decide something about me, handle me, do something about it. So I just start there. And uh, first of all, we make sure we, they have a physical in tray or something that serves that purpose. And then we just take all that stuff that's and throw it in there, you know, and you can create some pretty big piles out of some pretty small spaces. Believe me, you know, <laughs> just doing that. And then, you know, they may have, and there's like over in the corner, there's a broken printer. We don't put the broken printer in their in tray. We just take a piece of paper and write printer, you know, and write that on a piece of paper and throw that in their in tray. So we have representations of all of it. And then we say, okay, anything now let's, now let's get your, 
you know, cognitive space empty. And so then we say, what else is on your mind that's now not in this pile yet? Oh, should we adopt? Uh, oh, yeah, I need to hire a vice president. Uh, actually, I need to think about whether we should hire a vice president or not. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I need to research a new mobile phone service. I need to, uh, yada, yada. And for the typical mid to senior level professional that we have coached, it usually takes one to six hours just to do that process. Man, that's a, a lot had, of stuff circulating in your head that you randomly think about or access have, or don't. I, it, I had a guy that took over two days just to do that first process. He was one of those people we call a crazy maker. He'd be halfway through something, get totally excited about something else and leave that one halfway done somewhere and then move on to the other one. And this stuff was just everywhere. Right. And, you know, and so it just took that long. I mean, this, this, this was no dummy. He was the chairman of the two companies, you know, but he was just one of those kind of people that had let that stuff accumulate you know, uh, around him like crazy. So that's the first step, yeah. just getting all that out. And that, that can be transformational just itself. I mean, anybody listening to this right now, at some point, I'm sure has felt a little overwhelmed or confused and sat down and made a list and felt better, right? But if you reverse engineered, how come you felt better? The world didn't change. What changed was how you were engaged with your world, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. If, you, if you reverse engineered that and you like that feeling of feeling better and more in control and more focused, you'd never keep anything in your head the rest of your life. And I don't. Right. You write everything down from like, you know. Everything I can't finish in the moment that I might want to do something or decide something about later on. I'm right. not writing 50,000 thoughts a day. That's, that, that, they've estimated that's how many we have. <laughs> I'm, only writing, I'm only writing down input that I can't finish in the moment I think of it that might be relevant to me might be relevant. I'm right. not sure yet. You know, it, I, I'm not sure that, that recipe somebody told me about or that restaurant that I should try their takeout or a book somebody recommended I should read. I, you know, and if I'm taking notes in, in, a, in any kind of a Zoom meeting or whatever, I don't know yet what I'm going to do about those notes, but I'm not missing stuff that I don't want to miss, you know, about right. what to do about it. That 3 a.m. So, panic where you wake up and go, oh, forgot all about, right? You, you've you yeah, got it now yeah. written down. Uh, can we just a brief excursus? You mentioned this that I can't do in the moment. So the two minute rule, that's like, I think what a lot of listeners who are fairly new to this will discover is you've heard parts of this because it's so baked into so many cultures, but I've followed the two minute rule for years. And when I forget about it, I pay a price. But when I remember it, it's so helpful. What's the two minute rule? Well, you can only get to the two minute rule really after you do step two. Okay which is clarify what the next action is on the things that you need to take action. About. So you take your great big pile that took you an hour to six hours to of, of not pile, but your list of everything is now written down. And then step yeah. two is take, take one item at a time. Mm. Right. Now, if I were working with you, you would have written every one of those thoughts on separate pieces of paper and they'd be sitting up in a pile on your in basket. Wow. The reason is, is because when we go to step two, you don't want to jump around. We take, the first thing at the top, the rule is top item first. That item is glued to your finger until you make a decision about what you're going to do about it, what the next action is. And there's a one-way valve out of your investment. You can't stick it back in. <laughs> oh, so you can't, yeah, you can't have that thing. Is that like almost a variation of the touch at once rule? Like, eh, Yeah, but there are a lot of things you're going to touch a lot more than once. Uh-huh. But the first right. thing touch it touch you know, touch it once is it, it's kind of like that. But touch it once would be silly. Mm. Then you then you'd actually you know have to go buy cat food. The fact that you wrote cat food down, <laughs> right? That, okay. That, so little, I, I interrupted silly. you. Yeah. You're you're glued to that that one thing. You pull the first thing out of your entree yeah. until you clarify what is it, what's mm. the nature of this thing. Now, this could be an email. It could be a piece of mail out of your physical mailbox. It could be notes that you took in a meeting. It could be anything, right? And so we take it one at a time and say, okay, what is it? And then then clarify step is then to go through, is it actionable? Yes or no? Right? There's no There's no maybe. Maybe mm-hmm. is no, right? If it is actionable, then you need to ask yourself, what would the next action look or sound and feel like? Is that an email to send? Is that a, something to buy at the store? Is it a content of an agenda to go over with your life partner or your business partner? What, what's the next step? If you had nothing else to do but move on that thing, hmm. where would you go and what would the physical, visible action that you would take? And that's where the two-minute rule comes in. If you come up with an action item, 
Oh, oh I just need to uh, shoot Bob an email on that. How long would that take? Oh, 60 seconds. Do it. Right. That's the do it. That's the do it rule right then, because it would take you longer to organize that reminder than to finish it. Mm. So that's why two minutes came up. It's just, it's just a pure efficiency factor. Right. And basically you don't want to have to rethink or relook at stuff that you could finish very quickly. You got enough stuff you need to look at and reflect on that can't be finished in two minutes or less. Mm. Okay. That's, and that, that's, that is a good rule. It's amazing how much can actually be accomplished in two minutes or less. <laughs> It's amazing. Most people, most executives that I work with have no idea, you know, especially if I'm spending more than a day with them, you know, and, and by the way, tied to the next action, if you can do it in two minutes or less, if you can't do it in two minutes, can it be delegated? Mm. Especially when I work with the executives, can the action step be given to somebody else? And if so, if you can do that right then, do it right then. Right. And so they, they finish two minute stuff. They they start handing up stuff off as they're going through their pile. The next day, they're getting stuff back from staff. They're getting their things are coming back to them. They got oh my god, the world is working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm getting stuff done. You know, duh. yeah. Because you know? see that as strange as this may sound, the keys to getting things done is what does done mean, and what does doing look like. Hmm. And training Can you yourself find that? to think. Yeah. What does done mean and what is doing yeah. look like? Yeah. What does done mean? What does done mean if you think you want, you're not sure if you should get divorced or not? What, what would this be? What would finish look like? Well, I don't know yet. Well, how about finish? How about knowing uh, as your end result? So clarify relationship might be a project. So what does done mean? Done means I've got this off my mind because we've made the appropriate decisions. I'm now appropriately engaged with all the parties involved. Right. So that's done. So done doesn't mean that you have fixed, figured out everything that needs to happen. You just need to know what does happen look like. Hmm. So, what yeah, would, because you're right. Sometimes we haven't even thought about it to the level that we know, oh, is this project completed? Like, are we, right. are we finished? And what does, where is the finish line? Right. Sure. Oh, come on. I don't know. You know, anybody in, anybody in college, you know, has been given task of doing stuff. Have they really clarified with whoever their professor was, what would finish look like on this? Right. Right. You know, uh, what would be true, you know, hmm. and these are, they're great consulting questions to ask anybody. What would be true at the end of this board meeting? What would be true at the end of our conversation together, Carrie? Yeah, you know, that's a good question because so much of leadership is amorphous. It's like, uh, and and we talk about this tension on our team all the time, and it's true in church world, it's true in business world, but like, you know, when is more enough? Where is the finish line? Like you could always have more people, more clients, more customers, more profit, more revenue, um, a better culture. Uh, your article could always be a little bit better. Your sermon could be a little more polished. Your... A uh, book could probably use one more edit. Like that is the nature of a lot of knowledge workers. And you wrote this for knowledge workers. Like, you know, the nice thing about physical labor is you kind of know when you're done, you know, the product shipped. But for a lot of us, it's like, I don't even know when I'm finished. Yeah. Well, you're right. Clarifying that is one that that's a cognitive muscle. Most people have to train yeah. because you're not born doing that. Hmm. You're not born knowing how to cook spaghetti or how to raise kids or how to have a difficult conversation or how to speak English. Right. right. At some point, that became some sort of an outcome that you wanted to get to, and you could always speak better English. But sometimes the, my outcome, oftentimes my outcomes are just get this thing onto cruise control. Hmm. So you never, finish, you never finish growing sales. You never finish growing yourself. You never finish... Uh, you know, having your processes set up. You just need to make sure that your process is set up so that your process is not on your mind. Right. And things that are on cruise control by your definition would, would be things you don't have to worry about. Like, can I just, like Correct. getting dressed in the morning. It's not like that has to be on your list, right? Or eating breakfast, if it's the normal thing that you eat every sure. day. Where Where is the line between cruise control and something that makes the list? If it's on your mind, it's not on cruise control. Well, that's clear. That's yeah. clear. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't have to go very far. Anybody listening to this right now, where has your mind gone while you've been listening to me and Carrie? When you stopped listening to me and Carrie and your mind went somewhere else. 
Mm. That's what I'm talking about. Right. So if you're worrying about it, if you're thinking about it, it needs to be on a list. Yeah, but thinking about it, thinking thinking about it can look like a couple of things. Thinking about mm-hmm. it, if what you're doing is evaluating something and looking at it from different angles and giving yourself fresh perspective on it because I need to reflect on maybe the best approach to this or whatever. Yes, it would help to write those things down, but that's actually what your mind is for. Hmm. If you keep being reminded about the same thing, that you need to do something about it, and you need to do something about it. Now I need to do something about it. Now I need to do something about it. That's just wasted energy and totally inefficient thinking. You're not you're not improving your or maturing your thought process yeah. with those things. So maturing your thought process about a sermon, sure, that's what you need to do. You need to just make sure your head's clear enough and you've got space and room to then mature that thinking, right? So what so, you don't want on and if you're trying to you know craft a sermon, you don't want to be thinking about cat food. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. You write down cat food and you put it in your entry and you do that later. That's right. Um, again, people should get the book. It's really good. And there's so many resources. I mean, this is a global movement, so I don't, I don't want to do the, the, the full drill down, but I do want to ask you this question. You get that one to six hour mind dump where everything ends up, you've captured it all. And then, uh, I know there's a system, but like, how does that not become overwhelming? Do you then decide, okay, this, because you've got different categories for things. It's like maybe one day, maybe not. No, I don't need to do that. Like, how do you then begin to sort and uh, sort through everything that you've captured so it becomes manageable and uh, brings you a little more peace? Well, that's where step two and step three, where you clarify and organize everything in that pile. That's why those are, are important to do. If you just left it in the big pile, yeah, that could be pretty overwhelming because there's still a lot of thinking you haven't finished about all that stuff. That's why most people's lists, frankly, are just incomplete lists of still unclear things. You know, on the list, you'll see mom or bank or <laughs> vice president or credit line or, you know, I don't know, whatever you see. And you say, well, what are you going to do about it? Why is mom on the list? Yeah, you had one. Why'd you write it down? <laughs> well, her birthday's coming. What are you going to do about mom's birthday? I don't know. That's right. And so looking at mom on a list, if you haven't decided the outcome and the action step about it, will create as much stress as it relieved to begin with. Right. Because it's just reminding you, you haven't finished your thinking. You're not yet appropriately engaged with mom and birthday. Mm. So creating appropriate engagement is what you need to do about that pile. And by the way, even just creating the pile, most people feel incredibly better when they do that. It's like, you know, like taking a good relief, you know, and, (laughs) and, 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 you know, that's, that that won't be the end of it, but and sometimes you have to go through the the, re, the grief and relief gate. It'll you'll look at all of it and go, oh my god! But some part of you says, yeah, my god, I feel so much better having it out of my head because now you freed yourself up to then making much more uh, appropriate, evaluated decisions about the content. But you can't do it if it's just in your head. You just can't. Your head doesn't. It wasn't designed for that. So. And so that's what you have to do is, and that's what I discovered was the algorithm about how you get stuff off your mind without having to finish it. Hmm. Yeah, that is kind of counterintuitive, right? That, okay, you just got to write it down, you get it off your mind. But we think, I, I think the false promise is I'll feel better about it when it's done. No, you'll feel better about it when you've decided what to do about it, when you've captured it, and when you don't have to worry about it anymore. So you're like, no, batteries, and, I know and- that's Thursday when I go to the hardware store. Yeah. And when you've decided what the action step is and that you trust, you'll see the reminder of that action step or the right person will at the right time. Right. So that's why outcome and action become the critical elements. Come on, it's the zeros and ones of productivity. What are you trying to accomplish? And then how do you need to allocate your resources in order to make that happen? So, and by the way, why this is challenging, you know, it took me several years to really uncover the, the science behind all of that is these those two things come from two very different parts of your, your cognitive processor. The associative part of you or the visionary part of you comes up with the outcome, but it's the implementer part of you, the sequential part of you that actually nails it down to a real thing to do with your body. Hmm. Right. And that those, those are actually come from two different places in your brain. So you actually have to train yourself to be able to think both of those pretty quickly together, but it's not that easy, not that obvious. A lot of people have, you know, who, who sort of glanced at the GTD methodology and think it's just about action lists. And yeah, those are important. And that's pretty much all they've done, but they haven't figured out what the outcomes are 
for a lot of those actions. And then they just get busy doing a lot of action stuff that's not really focused toward specific uh, desired outcomes. And so coming up with a project list is one of the most challenging things for very sophisticated people to do. Most people have, by the way, and my definition of a project is anything you can't finish in one sitting. Anything right. that's going to take more than one action step to complete that you need to then keep track of that outcome. Mom's birthday, you probably can't finish in one sitting. Maybe it's like, oh, yeah, let me just go to the web and order some flowers. I'm done. Fine. You know, but if it's, you, know, you and your sister think you need to celebrate mom's birthday in some little bigger way, that's not going to be just one step. Right. You're going to organize you know? a party. You're going to order the flowers. You're going to buy the food. Oh, you're going to send out the invites. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be a project. So in that broad definition of project, most people that I've worked with have between 30 and 100 projects. Wow. That's a I coached this. I coached the chief information officer in a major Wall Street firm who had 140 projects after I coached him. Now that's pretty. That's pretty big, and a lot of those needed to be delegated. But he, you know, that was that was, as he started to curate the inventory, you know, of everything that had his attention. That's what he came up with. And some people, you know, I've I've worked with retired executives. They've got a few projects about the, the three or four boards that they're on and the not for profit they want to start and some other things like that. And, you know, they may have 20, 25, 30, 35. You know, so there's no right or wrong about that. That just is what it is. It's funny. People get mad at me about their list. I go, excuse me, that's not my list. <laughs> that's, that's, that's your list. <laughs> you have to decide how you want to track them. I think intuitively it would help you understand why you're so overwhelmed. If you end up being like, oh, my goodness, I have over 100 projects. That can be like a slap in the face where you're like, maybe, maybe I need 50. Maybe, maybe that's my bandwidth or, or, uh, you know, I, I could see that being a moment where you can realize, oh, that's why I'm so overwhelmed. Well, yes and no. Okay. You're usually overwhelmed because you haven't clarified each one of those projects and where they need to be and what you need to do about them. Hmm. I just read a very interesting article about multitasking you know, everybody's kind of poo-pooing that you can't multitask. Actually, you, you, you can, uh, you can't, you can't focus at any instant on more than one thing and put your conscious attention on more than one thing. Uh, but you can switch rapidly. And some of the most creative people have maintained, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of projects all at the same time, Einstein, Madame Curie, you know, people like that. What they would do is they could work on one, then get, they'd come to some stopping point you know, or get stale and they go, okay. And then they go focus on another one, but they just kept let, they kept placeholders where they left on all of these. Hmm. So then, then, they, then they could graze around with a hundred projects and think about that, move that one forward. Let me move that needle. Now I feel like working on that one, which is actually a very cool thing to do and might be very highly creative for a lot of people. As long as your brain is not spinning about stuff you left incomplete or unclarified or unorganized about what the project you just left because then some part of your brain is now subliminally trying to keep track of what that thing is and then keeps you from being able to focus on the next thing. And that's where a lot of the, it's not so much overwhelm, Carrie. I used to talk about this, this handles overwhelm and it does in, in, in a certain way, but overwhelm kind of handles itself. If you were truly overwhelmed right now, your building caught on fire, right? You'd, you'd handle it. You'd, you'd get yeah. focused you'd, at the next step. You'd, you'd, you know, tires on your car and taxes, you put them on the back burner, you know, uh, figuratively speaking. Yeah. And, um, and basically you get really focused. The problem is if your building is not on fire, there's a, there, there, the demons at the gate of all your options and possibilities come running at you. Well, Carrie, you could be doing this. Here's the next person you could do an interview. And by the way, have you really looked into that? And have you looked into that? And it's almost the stress of opportunity that creates now what I refer to as the ambient anxiety that most mm. people have. It's that vague gnawing sense that there's stuff out there you're either not handling, should handle, should be remembering, should be thinking about, should be dealing with, just don't know what the hell it is, oh damn. And so then you get into the busy trap or you go numb. Mm -hmm. you know, usually, usually the ways you know, people tend to then deal with that ang ambient anxiety if it gets too bad. The biggest issue, <laughs> if you want to call it an issue, the biggest barrier to people implementing what you and I are talking about is their addiction to that ambient anxiety. They're willing to tolerate it. Almost like they don't know what to do without it? Well, it's not even that conscious. They're just so used to it. Right. And truly, truly, it is a little scary if they suddenly didn't have it. 
my gosh, what if there was suddenly nothing on your mind? What if there was absolutely nothing pulling at you? What would you do? How would you use that space? See, this is really about creating space. It's not about being busier. It's about creating room. And you don't need time. You need room. It doesn't. How much time does it take to have a good idea? None. How much time does it take to, to be strategic? None. How much time does it take to be creative or innovative? None. How much time does it take to be loving and present with your kids? None. And yet most people would say those are kind of golden goodies to be creative and strategic and innovative and loving and present. Yeah. And then you think you need more time to do that. But as some wise person years ago said, you can never get enough of what you don't really need. So if, <laughs> if you think if what you think is time, you can never get enough. Hmm. And if you're, if you're not appropriately engaged with your life, you can never have enough time to do any of it. If you are appropriately engaged, you don't care. You're out of, you're, you've, you've, you've left time. That's actually very true. When you're fully engaged in something, time just kind of, kind of disappears. And you make that argument. Um, you say that uh, our productivity is directly proportional to our ability to relax. Is that right? Did I get that right? It's not very intuitive. Can you explain that, David? Ask an athlete. Mm -hmm. Ask an Olympic athlete. And what would he or what she you, tell what you, you? What do you? How much time do you think they spend stretching, and breathing, mm -hmm. and relaxing, so that they can they be fully present with the, the engagement? That's what they're doing. Yeah. Right? And you know, I I got a black belt in karate years ago, and the power in a karate punch comes from speed, not muscle. Hmm. That's why very very petite people can break boards or bricks. Not about muscle. It's about the speed of that pop. But a tense muscle is a slow one. Hmm. So it's having all this out of your mind. You finally can relax. You can focus. You can be fully present. You can be engaged, whether that's in work or a dinner with your favorite person. Or it's like, I'm just going to go for a walk and relax and not try to multitask. Well said. Okay. That's good. Now, uh, Getting Things Done, the original version was published in 2001. There's been a ton of cognitive research, neuroscience. We've learned a lot about the brain. You've got a section of that in toward the end of the book. But what are we learning? You're saying a lot of what you kind of picked up by observation is now being confirmed or explained by neuroscience and brain research. Can, can you explain some of the, the insights that have come up in the last few years? Well, one of the main ones, one I mentioned earlier, that your brain can only hold on to a certain number of things before you start to lose the ability to then optimize your cognitive functions, mm -hmm. to remember, to focus strategically, to be creative and whatever. The, if you're trying to keep track of too many things, in, in a way, it's kind of self-evident, at least to me it is, you know, but now they've proven that. Uh, they've also proven that uh, you don't actually have to finish stuff to then get more clarity in your head. You have to make sure that, that you have some sort of a plan that you trust that it will get taken care of in some external way. Hmm. Roy Baumeister is probably the top uh, cognitive scientist in the, in the U S uh, you know, has written, you know, hundreds of, of white papers and research that, that he did. He was at the university of Florida, I believe. And Baumeister, and he's, he came and interviewed me when he did, he, he wrote a book with John Tierney at the New York times called uh, willpower. They're the guys that sort of coined the term of decision fatigue. Right. And they, they were curious to me because they were just doing this research and kind of finding out some of this stuff. And they said, how come David Allen came up with this stuff years ago that we're just <laughs> discovering right now? And they flew out to, uh, to California when I was, when I was still living there and uh, asked themselves, you know, they were asking me, how'd you come up with this? Hmm. And so, uh, you know, mine was just, kind of street smarts and, you know, had a mentor who sort of taught me how to write stuff down and decide next actions on things and how powerful that was. And so, uh, anyway, and, you know, he, uh, some of his research has a lot to do with making sure that you've got appropriate places that you are placeholders for this stuff. And that that also relieves the mind of the spin, you know, that's going on with it. You know, it's kind of the, uh, it's sort of like the reason you're not worried about where you need to be two weeks from Wednesday 
at three o'clock in the afternoon is because you've got it in some external system you trust you're going to see at the right time with right. your calendar, yeah. right? You yeah. may not like where you have to be two weeks from Wednesday <laughs> at that time, but 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 it's not bugging you. You're not trying to remember it, mm-hmm. you know? And and so, you know, that's a lot of it. I, probably the second big thing, one is that your, your, your head's, you know, essentially for having ideas and it's a, it, it's a terrible place for holding on to them. Uh, maybe the second really big aha that's come out of all that is the need for the brain to rest. Yeah. But if you don't have, that. If, if you don't have enough sleep, if you're not taking good, a good nap in the afternoon, if you're not, you know, breaking up your work day into at least some five minute walk arounds, you know, that, mm. that, that stop your brain from spinning because there's a part of your brain, uh, that's the archive part of your brain that needs time to, uh, to, to curate all of the multiple inputs that you have even just in a day-to-day ordinary day, you're getting so many inputs and so many things that are going on in your head. That's why stepping back and having a little bit of reflective time or no think time, let yourself daydream, just walk around the block, not try to not think about anything is hugely beneficial to your cognitive process and your creativity. And so, you know, they, I saw, saw some research that said you, you could only focus, really focus, especially if you're writing something, any writers know what I'm talking about. It takes a lot of focus decision making to write something you know that you know from scratch hmm. you know write an article write a blog write a write a forward to somebody's book you know or write the next chapter those things that kind of thinking you know really takes a lot of cognitive brain power you know and they they said that about four hours max is all you can do in a day because it's a muscle that just gets tired and you got to stop then you start if you don't do that you start stepping on your own toes you start you know, fumbling around, you start duplicating yourself. You st- it's weird. And so, again, when you think about your brain as a muscle, then it needs, it needs like any muscle, it needs rest and relaxation. You know? So that then the archive part of your brain can then knit all that stuff together. That's why they've also proven sleeping on something is a real good way to solve problems. You have to have an intention to have the problem solved to begin with. You can't just solve a problem if you're not worried about it, not, not thinking that you want to solve a problem. You know, but if you've got, if you've sort of plugged in at least subliminally the intention, I need to figure out a way to, for us to da, 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 da. Sometimes the best thing to do is literally go to sleep on it because then what happens is you bypass your subconscious, you bypass your conscious conditioning and then allow your unconscious to then create those kind of connections, which is a lot of what the creativity process is. Creating connections you didn't realize were there before. I have so seen that those two, so those, often. Yeah. Yeah. So those two things empty your head and let it rest. And they both, they're very tied together. And, you know, people have been written about this stuff. You know, most of them, at least the ones that I know are big champions of GTD of this stuff. You know, read, read, read Daniel Levitin's The Organized Mind. Hmm. Fabulous book. He got halfway through the book and then he read mine. He went, oh, damn. And he called his editor and said, do I even need to finish this? Because David said it. <laughs> You know, and he's head of cognitive science research at, at uh, McGill. Oh, yeah. In Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, so there's lots of people like that uh, who've, you know, basically validated, you know, this in, in various different ways. Is there a connection, like, if you don't write things down, if you haven't got that list, does your restorative time, your naps to that walk in the park, to the walk around the block, to just trying to relax and do something else. If it's not written down, does that then pop up and kind of ruin sure. those times? That's why you wake up. That's why it's so important to get it down. Yeah. And yeah. that's why if you meditate, you better keep a pen and paper by you. Because as you start to relax, you're going to go, oh, oh God, that, I, that reminds me. Yeah, no kidding. Right. So having some sort of capture tool, like I do, I've had a capture tool with me 24 seven for 35 years. What do you use? Well, if I'm just walking around, the most commonly used tool is this thing called a note taker wallet. Right. Got my key credit cards and my, you know, my travel pass, you know, from the Netherlands and my a little notepad and a cool little monk monk pin that fits in here. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. That goes with me anywhere this goes with me. You know, which is, you know, most everywhere. So, uh, you know, on my desk. Got that. Pen pen. Another pen, pen another pad of paper. Awesome. For those of you who are watching, you can see this. Battery, right. And I've just got two notes that I've made just even before I started talking to you. 
that I still need to do something about. So, you know, that's most of my capture is low tech because it's fast, it's ubiquitous. And that's not my system. That's the system for capturing stuff that then will get into the system if I decide what to do with those things and I need to be reminded something later on. Right. But see, the, the more mature you get, it's not senility, it is sophistication, that the more mature you get, the more good ideas will not happen where you're going to implement that idea. Okay, can you explain you'll buying, that? Yeah. You'll be buying bread at the store thinking something to bring up at your sermon. That's, that's my life. And, and you'll, be, you'll be writing your sermon remembering you need bread. Right. Totally. A hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So while you're buying bread, you better have something that can grab that. Not because the muse, especially for sermon writing is very fickle. She will come in and leave you very fast. Yes. If you don't do something with it. I've learned that. Now, any notes on that? Because we all these days carry around one of these and I know you do as well. Any thoughts on digital? Yeah, but you got to turn it on. Oh, you got to turn it on. It's a pain in the butt. <laughs> I, I'll use it sometime, but come on, that's a lot faster. Right. And you stick it into that little black thing you just held up there. For many people, it's a black hole. Where'd it go? You know, what are you doing with it once it's in there? Mm-hmm. Especially if you just recorded it, you're going to have to listen back to it and then write down what you, what you just said. It's a good point. You have 15 different apps. I mean, I have Evernote, Evernote uh, Notes, Voice Memos, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes you capture it, but it can get lost. So you have a preference a little bit toward the analog then over the digital. For capture, yes. For capture, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. I'm going to look up one of those. Uh, what, do, what do you call that little uh, wallet? Because it's got your credit cards in well, there. Well, that, and... that was one that we made. We actually had made. It's called the Note Taker Wallet. We don't make it anymore. We didn't sell enough of them to afford to be able to oh, I would you know, buy one. Have, them, have them made. Well, you can find a lot of stuff kind of like this. There were a lot of people, Mont Blanc and, and some other people, kind of knocked this off once we created this you know, 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And so you can, you can, you can go to a yeah. good you know, kind of high end stationary store anyway. And they probably got something kind of like that. Oh, that's good to know. Um, let's talk about what digital has done over the last two decades, because it was a digital world in 2001, but I mean, it nothing like we're experiencing today. Um, any thoughts on how the digital clutter in our lives and the tendency to never be without a device or uh, have quiet, what, what that is doing to our brains and any thoughts on, productivity and digitalization well there's you know there's now a, a good friend of mine a guy named uh theo Campanoli. he's a, a belgian uh professor psychiatrist doctor you know kind of got every degree you could ever want who wrote a great book called brain chains chains like chains like you, you're chained okay. there and and he's done a lot of research he, he curated about 600 different studies that were done about all that and he's got a real rant about all that stuff, especially for the kids, that they're being shallow. They're not giving themselves time to do reflective thinking yeah. because it's all just spin. It's all just spin, 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 spin. It's all just surface stuff. And they're not taking any time to really think about things you know, that you need to think I'm about. I'm going to have stuff. to look at that book. Yeah. And, and it, it, you know, so I, I think there's stuff out there. I'm not a real expert on all that, that area. I think a lot of what's happened is that the, the digital world there haven't been that many things that have changed, you know, um, our work and lifestyle digitally uh, since the word processor and the spreadsheet right. and to some degree the internet. But for the most part, those things change the game. The word processor is going to let you write a much better sermon than when you had to hand write it. <laughs> or type it and then throw the whole page that's, out and start over again. That, yeah, that's right. Or use correct tape. Oh, yeah. Old enough for, yeah. to remember that. I do oh, my remember God. that. So uh -huh. before you write something, it damn well better be right. Not only that. White out. Properly yeah. held, you know, white out. Oh, my God. All that. So the word processor, you know, works more like your brain likes to work, which is have an idea and then later on figure out where it goes and what to do with it. Mm. So mm. that was a game changer. And the spreadsheet and, uh, you know, everything about a spreadsheet and relational databases and so forth changed the game, too. Now businesses, small businesses are running on Excel that they would have to have to have 25 accountants do what just an Excel spreadsheet can do with them for them now. Mm -hmm. That was a game changer. Since then, pretty much all that's happened in the digital world is speed and volume. Right. Right. A lot more stuff is coming at you a lot faster, you know, that you are then, you know, potentially are allowing into your universe. So you don't care about your neighbor's email. It's just yours. 
right? So you've just, you've created your own ecosystem that's collecting and allowing yourself to capture a lot of that stuff. And you still have to decide how much time you want to spend on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram and so forth, you know, uh, uh, and, and that, that is very independent, uh, for each person in terms of what do those mean to you? You know, what's important about those, where do those fit in your universe? And so, yes, there are now a lot more in baskets, you know, a lot of those, um, I kind of have a gripe about things like Slack and a lot of, a lot of those things that we're supposed to get rid of email. Yeah. Oh, come on. You're never going to get rid of e- trying to get rid of emails, like trying to get rid of bread, you know, come on. <laughs> Are you what, kidding? How do you guard against inbound? I mean, you're, uh, you're somebody who has a global profile. Um, we do live in a world of multiple inboxes. How do you handle all the requests that are coming your way and sort of the, the, the pace of life these days? What do you do to create space for yourself? I, I do what I've done for 35 years. I just empty out, empty all that, those potential inputs every day or every, every 48 hours anyway. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, Can I just you do, talk uh, about that? You do practice pretty much inbox zero. I know you're, from what I've, I've heard and read, your personal productivity system is, is built around a Lotus Notes application and email and that kind of thing. But you really are somebody who is a fan of emptying out that inbox on a regular basis. Can you talk sure. about why that matters? Well, do you only take out part of your garbage? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you thumb through your garbage and say, well, that's, the, that's not so smelly. Let me leave that. <laughs> that's a great metaphor. Do you only empty part of your mailbox, your physical mailbox? Like, oh, I'm just going to leave that in there because I don't think it's that, that important. You're so right. I've been in box zero for years and it is a peace of mind. And I see somebody who has like 2000 unread emails and I just almost have a heart attack for them. It's challenging. Yeah, well, I know. And it's called why? And if, you, if, if you've made an agreement with yourself that that stuff, I don't need to necessarily do anything about, I'm just going to let it fester in there and somebody will remind me about it later on if I want. And that you want a fester box, that's fine. You don't have any attention on it. I challenge people to do that. Why don't you just throw it away to begin with? You know? And it's fine if you want to have different categories of someday, maybe. Here's the things I might want to get to. Let me park that over here. But as long as you park it in the right place. See, I kind of make the joke, but there is a point to it. You got a bunch of crap, just physical crap around you. You don't want to deal with, don't want to deal with. I say, great. You know, here's how you walk free of all that stuff. Get yourself a big cardboard box and a big magic marker and label it. Crap I don't want to deal with. And put it all in there. And then you walk free. (laughs) If you don't do that, your whole life feels like there's full of crap you don't want to deal with. Whereas if you could categorize it, right, and put it in, you know, put it in, in, in its holding box, that's all that stuff. It's kind of like I've, right down here, I've got a little weird electronics drawer. Uh huh. And most people listening to this probably have something like that. It's uh, that right back that there charger. behind me. Yeah. Yeah, that charger, the thing crapped out, but the charger's good. I might need that, or I don't even know what the hell this is. I might need this and, and <laughs> whatever, and that's fine. Doesn't need to be any more organized than that, as long as you know where that's all those things are, mm. right? Then you, you know, I've got no attention on that until I get so full I can't throw any more junk in there, and then I then, <laughs> then I just sometimes I did the big purge cure- last year, and it's still filling up again. You're exactly right. It's like I don't know what this belongs to, but I don't want to buy it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about before we wrap up a couple more things quickly. The weekly review. Uh, that has been a really powerful thing. I know for a lot of people, uh, on my good days, I practice it. I have friends who practice it religiously. What's involved in a weekly review, David? Well, it's basically, you know, taking a look at all these different categories of things that you've accumulated in terms of reminders, you know, your calendar, your project list, your action list, getting those current because, you know, life keeps changing. And as good as and pristine as you are, give yourself another week and new stuff will have shown up. You haven't been able to capture or curate appropriately yet to see against all your other stuff. Some things have not now not as important as they were last week. And so you need to keep rethinking all of that stuff. So it's just a good external reminder system of all the stuff you got, yeah. you know, at all these different levels. And, you know, catch all the, oh, God, that reminds me I ought to, as well as then open up lots of creative thinking that happens. It's not just a static process. It'll, you, I, I guarantee you, if you actually do a thorough weekly review, you'll get some creative ideas you're glad you have, and you wouldn't have had them had you not sat down and done that kind of review, pull up the rear guard, get current, you know, with all your stuff. 
So everybody listening to this has had something probably show up in the last three or four or five days that you know you need to do something about, but you haven't had time to think, sit down and think exactly what it is. You just know you got it. Mm. Right? That's what I'm talking about. Right. You're not going to stop that process. So what, you know, how often do you need to do that kind of review and reflection? There have been times when I had to do it twice a day because things were so fast. Because once I get down in the weeds and focus on something, I, I lose everything else mm. in my consciousness. And then I come up for air. Go, now, where the hell am I? What planet am I on? What's next? And I better have a good orienting map and not just try to trust my brain to tell me that. I better see everything out there. Right? If you've ever been in a, if you ever managed a boat, you know, I had a sailboat I have, a couple of times. Yeah. I, I, guarantee, I guarantee you, you better come up for air and look around on some consistent basis to see where you are. You know, how are things? You know, what about the wind? What about the waves? How many of the But yeah. Oh, that big ship, that's going to get here sooner than I think. Mm-hmm. Coming toward me in the same trajectory, you know? Totally. So there's, yeah. So, you know, anything like that. So it's, it's just like, you know, in a way, it's nothing new. Anybody who's, you know, leading a complex life with multiple variables of things going on at any one period in time needs that kind of reflection time. Yeah. You know, to be able to step back and take at least an hour for most people, you know, a good hour. You know, if, if I had to boil it down, if we're getting to close here, you know, come on guys, just get stuff out of your head, decide the next actions on the things you're going to move on and then do some sort of regular review on some consistent basis of all your stuff. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll feel so much better and make yeah. better decisions and be your priorities will be much clearer to you and you'll be nicer to your kids. <laughs> there's a lot of that in there too so this is almost 300 pages the new edition um there's often i think from an author's perspective and, and a practitioner's perspective there's there's often a hidden jewel that leaders miss so we've captured some of the basics it's a it's a robust system is there one thing you would say hey if you really want to take getting things done seriously make sure you don't miss this most leaders do is there anything like that in your system that you're like hey just give this one a little more attention well, you know, the, the kind of the final chapters that talk about the, you know, the first part of the book is just kind of lays out the description of the methodology and the various steps. Yeah. The second part of the book actually walks people through if they want to implement this, it walks them through a kind of a virtual coaching process. Mm-hmm. Hey, take this here, put this there, walk yourself through it. And the last part of the book is, oh, by the way, here's a lot of the uh, uh, hidden or not or subtle potentially transformational stuff that happens when you start to implement this stuff. You won't know that until you actually start to implement it. So I'd say that's part of it is kind of the back of the book is the, Oh, by the way, stuff you know, that's there. However, just tactically, the thing most people miss and probably the biggest sleeping giant is the natural planning model on chapter three. Hmm. How do I take, you know, I might get all this under control, but how do I think through mom's birthday? How do I think through, you know, reorganize the department. How do I think through design the software? How do I think through, you know, reorganizing my church board? Can you give us a you know, thumbnail on that? Yeah. Sure. Well, it's just, I just discovered years ago what our brain naturally does. The way you got dressed, the way you talk, the way you get out of door is you have a, you have a, some sort of a purpose, you know, go have dinner, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you have some vision of having dinner. You have a purpose, then you have a vision of what it looks like if I fulfill that purpose. And then you brainstorm, what are all the things we're going to cook and how am I dressed and what time will we do it? And then you brainstorm all the different potentially relevant data about it. Then you organize that relevant data called, oh, okay, let me go change clothes before we eat or let Mm -hmm. me go handle this or let me run the store, grab some butter or whatever. And then, you know, step five is you then act on that once you've organized it. So you, you, you have a big why, then you have a what it looks like, and then you have a how in part one, how is all the potentially relevant stuff and how part two is just, okay, now organize that in some coherent form. And then, then there's the now, okay, now what? Mm-hmm. Once I've done that thinking. So you could do that on a sermon. You could do it on a wedding. You can do it on reorganizing a company. You could do it on anything, but most people don't do that. Most people don't have a natural planning model. They have an unnatural planning model where they sit down and try to organize first before they clarify purpose and vision. You're so right. I thought about this. And when I get it right and I do it right, I've thought about what do I want to accomplish? What do I want this <clears throat> party, this dinner, this meeting to be about? Rather than just jumping right into the brass tack. So all of us who teach and a lot of leaders who are listening to this teach, you do, always have our Achilles heel. 
So I got to ask you, of all the things you teach in getting things done, which has been consistently the biggest struggle for you? It's like, oh yeah, this one's just always a challenge. Or maybe there's nothing. I know for me and the stuff I teach, there's always a challenge. Uh, not really for me. I, I you know, because I developed this, you know, piece by piece. I didn't wake up one morning with some grand epiphany. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then I yeah. kept following on this. This is like a long string of epiphanets over several years to put all this mm-hmm. together. But I put it together for myself personally. So these became just habitual patterns that I did. I just yeah. turned around and used that for my clients, created the same type, sort of thing for them. And then at some point, somebody asked me to put all this stuff in some sort of a format. You know, so they could get their whole company, a large corporation, to do this stuff, and I, so I designed a training around this. So that that then started to frame the methodology, but the methodology was already built into my DNA or built into my blood by that time. So I was just, you know, I can't remember when I didn't do this. That's a wonderful yeah, place I'm, to be. You know, I, I guess Achilles' heel is the better you get at this, the more crazy you allow yourself to be. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? What do you I, mean by that? I can That's... let I can let my life just totally fall apart and not handle any of this stuff over a you know extended period of time because I know I could fix it fast. <laughs> ah, there you go, bingo. Okay, mine. I do a lot of teaching on how to say no, and I still struggle with that on a regular basis. It's like, yeah, but yeah. you're right. I guess I guess I guess you kind of could. You could take the brakes off, but. You're not. I appreciate that at this stage in your life, you're giving back to to all these leaders. So if people want to learn more, where where can they find out more, David? Oh, just go to gettingthingsdone.com. You'll see our website. Wherever you are on the planet, if you're interested in more in-depth coaching and training, just click on training and coaching on our website and then put in your wherever country you are. We've now certified master trainers and trainers around the world who are well qualified to deliver you know, this program in a, in a more, in a training format, obviously the book is a way to do it. Uh, the YouTube channels, look up David Allen or GTD or whatever. There's, you'll see, you'll hear, you know, <laughs> many more hours than you would probably want to tolerate from listening <laughs> to me talk about this with a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. So those are all ways to do it. And the book really is a manual. Actually, we wrote, you know, uh, we wrote the getting things done workbook last year. We, we published that because the book is a little daunting you know, for a lot of people. I just wrote it as a manual to get it all out of my head and to, to basically curate and, and, and describe what I'd learned in my 25 years up to that point. Uh, and so that, that can look or sound like a lot of things for a lot of people. But if they wanted a simple how to get started, the workbook is sort of the 10 quick steps to take to sort of get you into the program and get going with it. So that's another, that's another avenue. We'll link to everything in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Great. A lot of people like the audio book, especially if they are on, they commute a lot or just like to listen more than read. So the audio book for getting things done is out there. So all that, all that good stuff. Great. David, thank you so much for being with us today. You've been so generous with your time. My pleasure, Carrie. It was fun. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.